Hello, this is Michael Stone, the host of We Earth Radio, where we have conversations that make a difference. We're committed to bringing you leading edge thinkers in the areas of environmental restoration, social justice, conscious evolution, and spiritual fulfillment. In our programs, we look for positive solutions to local and global issues that leave you touched, moved, and inspired to action. Our weekly guests include local and global experts and concerned citizens working together to heal the wounds that separate, alienate, and marginalize people. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to We Earth Radio. This is your host, Michael Stone, and I'm excited to be talking about psychedelics and psychotherapy with Tim Reed. He's uh, talking to me from London. He's a psychiatrist and a psychotherapist with degrees in neuroscience and medicine. And after heading the services for psychiatric emergencies and crisis intervention at the Royal London Hospital for 20 years, he's now involved in clinical research at King's College and Imperial College London University on the therapeutic use of psychedelics. He's completed trainings in psychoanalytic psychotherapy and transpersonal psychology with Stanislaus Groff and is a certified facilitator of holotropic breathwork. The author of Walking Shadows and co-author of Breaking Open, he lives in London and he wrote this book with Maria Papasperu. Papasperu. Just welcome, Tim. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Michael, and uh, really great to to join you. Looking forward to the conversation. Let's talk a little bit. It's a subject that really interests me, and I'm curious why you think so many people at this time are turning to plant medicines and other psychedelic modalities. In search of healing. Mm -hmm. Um, Of course, healing is in some ways quite a new word you know when I went into psychiatry it wasn't a word that you used in relation to you know people with maybe mental health difficulties and the word growth wasn't used so often and you know in in my my professional background as a psychiatrist you know we were trained to take a, a very medical approach you know where you look at people as a as, as a specimen, if you like, and you make a diagnosis and generate a, a, a treatment plan. And, you know, so, sometimes that is helpful, um, but very often, of, of, of course, it's not. And um, so the, the question is, how can you really get to the bottom of what might be troubling and distressing people? Mm-hmm. How can you find out what is really the matter? And it's often multi layered and mysterious. And then how might you be able to work with that in a, you know, in a in a skillful, gentle way that promotes healing and growth, and you know maybe is not just good for the individual, but is good for the, for the community, the, the small communities and the, the wider community. How can we grow as individuals? How can we grow as a whole? How can we become more whole? How can we how can we stop hurting each other? Um, you know, how can we stop bouncing off each other with those jagged edges that arise out of our out of our woundedness? Um, I mean, f- for me, it's been a really long learning journey. You know, it's interesting hearing you read my 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 my, bio- my, my biography and the things that I've done and the bits of paper that I've got attached to my name. And of course, when you're in a uh, a deep space with you know a client a participant a, a human being you know in in a psychedelic space or you know a meditative space a you know a healing space whatever it is these qualifications these bits of paper just get in the way and the first thing you need to do is get out of the way of yourself and just be there with a genuine sort of presence that you know I, I'm here to 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 support whatever is unfolding for you and that's that's all I'm that's all I'm going to do I have no agenda I have no axe to grind I have no theoretical system that I'm speaking from I I'm just here with my my heart and my my compassion and my wish for you to to unfurl and grow into your your beauty and your wholeness and your strength 
or whatever it is you you need to do you know if you need to show grief or work with trauma or go into shameful places or then I you know I'm, I'm, I'm here with you and that's that's the paradigm change that, that that's the paradigm change that you know is 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 particularly difficult for those of us with qualifications um, and so, so what this book is about, you know, I've been working with Maria for, for, for some time. We, uh, you know, we both, uh, we're both psychotherapists. We both have a Jungian persuasion. Um, we, we, both, we both have a long-term interest in working with deep spaces. Um, and what we really want to do is to put together a multi-author collection uh, of people that we really respect who, who, who know about this work and to put together a collection of voices, you know, working in different ways, different substances, different generations. But the one thing they all really have in common is that, uh, that, that humanity, that heart. Um, you know, it's important to have the knowledge for training the background, um, but, but also the heart. Um, and I, I guess what Maria would maybe want to say at this point if she was here was something about the archetypal feminine. Um, you know, the way in which the, the older models, you know, the medical diagnostic model with its penetrative insights and its certainty and its narrowness of vision, you know, which can of course be, be helpful, but there's a certain kind of archetypal masculine flavor about that. Whereas in this sort of work, it's more to do with germination, nourishing, softness uh supporting stuff like that you know which uh, qualities we often associate with the, the archetypal feminine and you know, it's not that one is better than the other when we talk about archetypal feminine and masculine it's, it's more more about getting the balance right yeah balance i think is the important thing but the feminine is definitely lacking in that balance side um i, I think it's interesting how you mentioned healing has uh, that word wasn't even something you would think of because it was very mechanistic. Like, you know, something's broken like a leg, you fix it. And now the healing is really talking about whole body, mind, spirit, emotions. So there's a connotation of healing is to bring wholeness or pack perhaps back to our original goodness or soul blueprint. But I'm also uh, really interested in how the movement towards psychedelic therapy contrasts to other psychotherapy mo modalities, because something you said really caught my attention there was how it's not about the piece of paper. It's not about what you know. It's really about who you're being to assist and hold people in a loving space which of course relates to adaptive beginnings too, where much of the trauma was that we didn't get seen, held, heard, soothed, nurtured, all of that. So just to be a presence is so powerful. Can you talk a little bit about the difference of the typical motto, which is still taught in universities of psychiatry and the, the difference between using uh, psychedelics? Yes. Um, so it, I with, with, with psychedelic therapy, um, we talk a lot about the, the preparation and the integration as well as the session it, itself. And um, a lot of the preparation is about the development of the therapeutic relationship, but also ideally you really want to get a knowledge of the, the person that you're working with, the major developmental hurdles, what's been important in life, the quality of the parenting, you know, the uh, ancestral issues, um, what early attachment was like, what was going on in the family. Um, and that, that, that might not inform the medicine session so much, but it will help make sense of what came up in the medicine session when you're also doing the, the integration. Um, and we're, we're slowly learning about how to work with expanded states in the UK. I think in the USA, you have, you, you have more of the older generation who maybe kept some of the skills alive during the period of prohibition. I think we have less people like, like, like that in the UK. 
Mm -hmm. We have all these questions and it, the work is unfolding in the research environment and the research environments are quite rigid in what you can do. So the duration of treatment with people is pretty short term. So people either get one, two or, 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 or three sessions. Um, so what we're really learning to do at the moment, and it's happening slowly, and I, I think every, every, every clinical trial we take part in, we, we, we gather more experience and more skills, but really how to, um, how to work intelligently, skillfully, heartfully with these substances to, um, to, to really cause lasting change. Um, and it is difficult, it is difficult. And um, in the previous generation of LSD psychotherapy, the most prominent UK practitioner was a, a psychiatrist called, called, called Ronald, Ronald Sanderson. He worked closely with a Jungian therapist called, called, called Margot Kuttner. Um, and they worked over long periods of time with, with people in, in an LSD psychotherapy unit. And the results were quite encouraging, but the results were not stunning. And in the early 60s, Ronald Sanderson lost interest in LSD psychotherapy for, for a number of reasons. I, I think he was tired. I think there was adverse publicity was beginning to come out. But also I think he saw that some of the new um, antipsychotics and antidepressant drugs were actually having a dramatic impact on the symptoms of of, 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 of psychiatric patients. So, you know, so he, he could not, he, he, he kind of lost interest in LSD psychotherapy at that point. Um, some of the ways in which they worked with people were much less intensive compared to how we work with people today. So, so in those days, contact was intermittent. So the, these days we would always have at least one person, almost always two people with the participant um throughout throughout the session from from start to finish whereas in in those days people were were, were often left alone for quite long periods of time although there, there was always somebody there if, if necessary um, so maybe there was less potential for some of the attachment issues uh to be worked with maybe there was less potential for skillful work with traumatic issues when they 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 sometimes come up when, when, when they used to come up um, on the other hand, with the relatively short-term work we're doing with people in psychedelic trials today, I think quite often you're, you're really just working with quite superficial layers of the psyche. And I think there's a real question as to whether, you know, you, you have the opportunity to, to, to get to the layers of trauma that you need to work with, because it does, it does take some time. In fact, Ronald Sanderson always used to say that you don't really get to the um the, the the substance of value until you get into you've had four or five sessions and yeah. Stan, Stan Groff used to used to see it used to see it similarly um, you you mentioned you mentioned um in that period where he found that the pharmaceuticals were actually producing greater results in treating the symptoms yes so I, I want to underline the symptoms are not necessarily the integration that you're talking about. So maybe we can talk about that deeper level, what integration is and how that differs from necessarily the adaptations and the symptoms that people are expressing. So if you take a trauma-based approach to, um, to what emerges in psychological work, um, then we would say that every single one of us has got developmental trauma somewhere in our psyche. So we're looking beyond kind of trauma of commission where bad things are done to you by abusers. Uh, we're looking beyond obvious, um, uh, obvious deficiencies of care. Uh, it, but we can also look to the everyday sort of trauma that, 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 that we've all had in our background. Um, and so this is trauma that it would not be would, would might not even seem to be a trauma if you if you've observed it, but it feels like a trauma to the raw developing psyche of the infant, the toddler, the the the, the child. Um, and what we think is we we think that that trauma affects the way we we live our lives. We we 
we erect our, our ego structures, our ego defenses around these traumas, especially maybe these very early traumas. Um, and these very early traumas will often have a flavor of what is often called annihilatory anxiety. Um, you know, such a profound anxiety that it is, is, is impossible to articulate, um, but it feels so raw, so visceral, that maybe you're going to be extinguished. Um, it, it may be that that's one of the, the, the earliest, most profound traumas that, that we all have. It might even originate in birth, um, you know, the, the birth process, which of course is such an extraordinary physical trauma, uh, the like of which most of us will never see again in our lives. So there's a real question as to what is the imprint of, of these formative traumas? How does it shape us? And how does that play into the, the structures with which we engage with the world um, and the, the problems that that cause? Um, and, you know, in, in some cases might turn into the symptoms of what we might describe as, as mental illness. Now, if you're using the mental illness paradigm, you know, you might give some psychiatric medication that might um, that might stabilize some of the symptoms, and that might give somebody a, a more stable platform upon which they can live their lives and develop healthier relationships. And you know that 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 sometimes happens. Um, and it might even be, you know, if you're feeling optimistic and it's a nice sunny day, it might even be that you would hope that if somebody has that that stable platform, can develop relationships that. But some of those earlier traumas will naturally will naturally resolve in the context of, of new nourishing relationships, etc. Um, but the psychedelic approach, the deep psyche approach, is is to find a way of going back to those formative traumas, um, and maybe even to 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 re to re experience them quite fully and viscerally, um, emotionally. Physically, often it's very, very, it's a very embodied experience when you go back to these places and really be supported through the full expression of that and come out of the other side. And often when, when people do that, it feels, you know, and often people need to do that more than once, um, but often that can feel very liberating. It feels as though, you know, you can, um, but what you went through is, substantially resolved maybe it's not fully resolved but substantially resolved you don't need to be afraid of it anymore um, and it makes it possible to engage with the world in a different way so that so you could say that that's a process that's, that is more like healing and transformation and of course other things happen in psychedelic experiences you know we know that sometimes people have quite profound numinous experiences a sense of sacred a sense of connection with something greater than, them, than themselves, um, a sense of a bigger picture, a sense of, of things making sense, those bigger aha moments where you can kind of see why things maybe even had to be the, the, the way that they were. Um, and so, you know, and, and if that happens, then you form a relationship with that bigger picture in a way that, um, that may trump the, the, the previous pictures that you had, you know, the previous narratives that, that, that you, you had of yourselves. Brings about kind of a transcendence, really. It is about a transcendence, uh, but that's only part of the picture. If you're, if you're going through a trauma, if you're, you're reenacting a trauma in a, you know, in a psychedelic or expanded state experience, and it's so important that, that trauma is, is held and is met with you know, the, the kind of parental support, parental life support that was probably not really available in the way that it needed to be when that original trauma happened. So when people go back to a trauma, they not only experience it, but they're, um, they, they, they have, it could be called a, a, a reparenting, a reparenting uh, experience. And, you know, the, the, the hope is, is that that um, profoundly changes some of these attachment patterns that from no one being there when you really needed it, that somebody is, somebody really is there when you need it. Yeah. And of course, in a psychedelic state, the, the import of that is, 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 so much is so much amplified, is magnified. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, I think of trauma from, from my experience and, and learning as unexperienced past. Un, un, you know, that it was, that we adapted because it was too much. So we pushed that 
whatever the experience down, was down and then adapted to that. So integration is really that adult experiencing and seeing and understanding how that happened. That, that to me is how we integrate that part of ourselves is, is that, and also the part about being seen by another, being seen, seeing that part and, and it being okay to see that part. Another thing I think that's different and important in working with psychedelics is the container, the ceremonial setting that's often there, especially with like ayahuasca influence from the South, the environment, the kind of ceremonies that are used in plant medicine work. What are your thoughts about that and the importance of that? Yes, so it, it, that, that's the difference tradition um so um and again the the ritual the safety of the container the knowledge that you're in safe in safe hands um some of the author, some of the authors in our book are from the ayahuasca tradition and have worked very closely and extensively with um with with mas masters of that of, of that tradition that that's not my work, so I can't I can't speak directly. Well, what to about it. set and setting then? To put it in that language, because I think you use that language somewhere in the book, or maybe it was, there were a lot of people in the book, so I'm not sure if that was yeah. yours or someone else's. So so we talk about the set as the mindset, and the mindset really needs to be up for the hard work ahead, um, and needs to be prepared to be able to tolerate um, a re-experiencing of trauma if that is what comes up. Mm -hmm um and go towards it with you know enough self-compassion enough curiosity um and be able to work with um the the, the, the therapist if it, if it does come up now for some people that's really quite a big ask and you know i think that's a significant question mark about the future of this work because certainly my experience in in general psychiatry was that it was quite a small minority of patients who would really be up for that work and would really be able to tolerate uh, the, the, the pain that inevitably comes up. Um. Yeah, well, you know, one of the things that I'm drawn to particularly is the somatic approach mixed with the psychedelics. The uh, having someone there to put their hand on your shoulder now that, you know, wouldn't do that in normal psychology, but to, to, or put your hand on the person's foot or just when they're, they're needing touch. And that for me seems like an important part of that nurturing to provide the integration for people. What are your, what are your thoughts around the somatic element in there? So I, I started training with Stanislav Grof about 20 years ago and he was the um, original LSD psychiatrist, psychotherapist. Uh, originally from, um, from, from Prague back in the day and then worked in the States for many years. And he developed um, holotropic breathwork, which is a non-drug method uh, that induces psychedelic states once LSD research became illegal and has been working with that for 50 years. And when I started training with him, that, that was the big, one of the huge paradigm shifts um, that I had to take on board, that rather than working with ideas and words, usually very often what you need to work with is held within the body um, and unfolds in a very mysterious way um, and so much of the, the trauma release work seems to happen in a very in a very physical way and it's our job to support that um, and of, often that's a very a very active very active process but it seems very relieving and helps to go to those words to, to those those places beyond words um, so 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 does that and in in psychedelic therapy in you know, sort of therapy that we, we we do these days um as part of a preparation and part of the establishment of a set in the setting development of a therapeutic relationship then it's important to practice the use of touch so um the idea is is to, is to support people to go to go deeper into the experience so the questions are you know, if something comes up for you how would we how would we know how would we know that you're distressed? How do we know what you'll need, what, what you need? Um, what's, what would work best in terms of supporting you? And then you might rehearse some 
you know, some, some basic, um, some basic ways of physical support, like um, hand holding or hand on forearm or hand on shoulder or, or, or a combination of those. And those are the basic, um, the, the, the basic methods of physical touch and support that we probably rehearse with everybody. Um, now, if somebody gets into a really complicated trauma, something really comes up powerfully in their body, um, might, might even be some, some sort of birth reenactment. I was working with somebody recently who had a re-experience of a cord round neck experience. In a, in, in, in a psychedelic session. And some, sometimes you need more, 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 more complex ways of, of supporting the process so that instead of it becoming, just going back to the experience and a re-traumatization, that there's a process of actually going through it, working through it, so that you come out to the other side of a sense of, of, of completion and healing. Those skills are quite difficult to learn and difficult to teach. Uh, so as a, as a community of psychedelic therapists, uh, very much work in progress. I think one of the other things, you know, talking about birth and, and before birth and so much of the trauma is not explicit, it's implicit. And I think the old models would be to go and try to figure out, well, what happened? And yet so much of the energy is actually pre-verbal, it's implicit. So how does, how does the psychedelic approach expand on that ability to integrate those earlier implicit non-memories that were traumatic? Well, I, I think what lies behind your question is the, the extent to which, to which theory is, is helpful. And I think theories sometimes are helpful in terms of providing a roadmap. Um, so, you know, if you think in terms of early, early developmental experience, perinatal experience, and sometimes those models are, are helpful. But so often it's not, it's not really necessary to construct a narrative. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's more acknowledging the feelings, you know, what came up, what was it like, what did it feel like, what does it feel like now, um, how, how does this play out, how does this play out in life, um, what does it mean? Um, what has it meant in the past? Uh, what does it mean now? And how how might how might meaning how might meaning develop? Um, you know, I mean, we were talking a bit about the archetypal masculine earlier on. I think there is something of the archetypal masculine about the the, the need to develop a theory, the need to fit it into a model, um, and often it's not needed. You know, one model very so rarely hits the bone. That's one, one of the problems with all the trainings that people do. That you, know, you, you do become wedded to a model. You start seeing things through the lens of that model and you miss so much. Um, yeah, no, that you're, that you're addressing exactly what I was thinking of there. Thank you. But, but having said that, I mean, we, we talked a bit about perinatal experience. I mean, I, you know, I, I have found that a helpful model. Um, I, I think there's a certain range of experience that... I cannot make sense of uh, without going back to that layer of, of, of perinatal trauma. Um, and it helps me to make sense of, of it. I might not necessarily um, impose my sense making on the person I'm working with. That might not be right. But in terms of giving me a bit of a steer as to, you know, what does this mean? How common is it? Yeah, I think it's really common. Uh, what tends to happen next according to my previous experience? Um, you know, what experience do I personally have of that? What, um, you know, I, I think that is helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm looking in my own, you know, perinatal and, and my own, my, my parents were both at Pearl Harbor. Uh, my father was a fighter pilot and then I was born between two atomic bombs. Um, and so that period of stress, I, I, I clear from all the work I've done my, on myself, which is how I got into the, the business, so to speak, is, um, you know, those, those early traumas. And of course that led to many other difficulties uh, after birth, but that early part, um, I've been able to, with psychedelics and other ways, uh, venture back and get a sense of that. And I was, interested also one of the things I've been really looking at is the ancestral path and the 
passing on of many of these traumas and how often that happens, which in my, my case has happened through a number of generations um, and becomes clearer and clearer as I look at that. So how, how can the ancestral part and that uh, perinatal natal part be brought out the energy of it and healed? I guess you kind of answered it before, but the... Well, that, I mean, that, that's where we get on to the really interesting stuff. And, um, you know, in psychedelic work, we, you know, our experience of this is limited because of the short-term nature of clinical work. In my holotropic breathwork work, um, you know, I've been working with people for many years over a period of time in my own process. I mean, we, we, we very often find that people go back to ancestral memories um, and they have transpersonal experiences. And often the portal to that is through early trauma. So very often we find that people might take a certain sort of path back through re-experiencing of things that have happened in their life, maybe getting back to something that seems more like perinatal trauma, something which is pre-verbal, um, you know, a, a state of terror, a state of going towards death. And then very often that seems to act as a portal, um, you know, a, a, a chink in ego structures through which you go to something which lies beyond ego. Uh, and often people will feel that They've gone back to, you know, conception, to preconception, to maybe things that happened to their relatives, uh, maybe things that happened um, to people that they have no connection with, uh, but happened in the previous historical era. Um, and that might open up into a, a more kind of cosmic experience that, you know, that doesn't relate to any particular uh, human life. Um, and these sort of experiences are common in holotropic breath work. In the psychedelic trials at the moment, they are, they are not common. In fact, they're, they're, they're surprisingly rare. But I would expect that, you know, as, as people had more and more sessions, that these deeper layers of psyche would become a lot, a lot more available. Um, the psychedelic work is, is really young, in some ways quite naive, compared to the wealth of experience that we've had in, you know, in, in, in other ways of working with expanded states. Um, have you had any experience with family systems work and any thoughts about how that relates to this? So that, that's Maria's speciality. So oh. she, she's, she, she's trained in, in constellations. She's, she's a constellations practitioner. Right. And in, in the training course that we're developing at the Institute of, of Psychedelic Therapy, I should say that Maria and I have, 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 have launched the Institute of Psychedelic Therapy and we're, we're gonna start our first two year training um this this coming weekend oh and family constellations is is going to play a prominent role in that so we're, we're, we're deeply interested in, in 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 the role of ancestral uh the the the, the ancestral and how, how that plays out um, and how, how you access it and how you work with it um, yeah. yeah yeah i worked with him many years ago uh in amsterdam and uh, more on an organizational level, but I'm just amazed at what comes out of the constellation with somebody who's adept at doing that. Uh, yes. Someone I'm starting to work with here is also working with family constellations, and it's it's kind of spooky sometimes the way things show up and the people put together the constellation. Yeah. So, so, so what, so what the model is, um, working with constellations and working with transpersonal experiences, is that the, the the Western scientific paradigm that we are individual units of consciousness, that there's no consciousness outside the brain, that consciousness isn't entirely derived from neuronal process, but that that's a partial model, and that consciousness is is more complicated than that. Uh, there's an element of consciousness that maybe lies outside the brain that is part of the fabric of, of the universe. Um, um, you know, I, I'm not saying that is the case. I'm, I'm saying that that's another model that, um, that, that, people start, that people start becoming more interested in once they've had, had some of these un, unusual experiences. That there's a part of consciousness that derives from brain process and a part of consciousness that lies outside brain processes but is accessed through brain processes. And as we have these, these deep experiences, whether meditation or psychedelics or whatever, it, it, help, it helps move us along the spectrum so that, so that some of the 
um, some of the more um, transmissive transpersonal elements of consciousness become a bit more available for us. And I, I think you see that in constellations work. I mean, if you do constellations work, it becomes, it becomes apparent that you are receiving information that, you know, that, that comes to you in, in, a, in an extraordinary way. Um, we see that in synchronicities. Right. Um, so if you have a powerful synchronicity, that is the most powerful proof for, 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 for most people. It's not going to prove things to anyone else, but it'll prove to the person that has experienced the synchronicity that there's a connection between you know, your own internal mental process and something outside, um, some, something in the, in, the, in the universe. Tapping um, into some larger field. Yes. And, and, the, and the more work that you do with expanded psyche, the more open you become and the more likely synchronicities mm -hmm. are, are to happen. I mean, if you work in a, you know, as a hospital psychiatrist as I did, if you work it very much in a you know, conventional paradigm, you know, you're really busy, you're functioning at a certain level and synchronicities probably aren't going to happen. Um, so, you know, again, these, the, the, these openings um, uh, allowing people who are very firmly rooted in one model to have access to another model, you know, maybe having their first experience of holotropic breath work um, or, or a psychedelic experience is, is so helpful to people because it opens eyes, it opens minds, it allows the possibility of thinking, seeing things in a different way. Yeah. Timri, talk about your sense of this time that we're in. You know, we've been through two years of COVID, we've got uh, a new war going on, and as well as 40 other wars around the world. There's um, so much tension, anxiety, fear. Um, how can plant medicines help to alleviate and open us to um, finding new ways of coping with the, the stress that's, that's in the, if, speaking of the field, that's in the field? Well, that, that's such a sort of huge and multi-layered question. Uh, I suppose one possible answer is that plant medicines are making their presences known at a time when we really need them. And how to think about the challenging experiences that we're going through. And we know that you know, with a challenging deep psyche, psychedelic experience, to come at it from a position of you know, compassion, uh, of curiosity, of how, what is this teaching me? Um, how can this inform our growth? What is the work that we need to do here? Now, if we come at it from that point of view, maybe some answers start taking shape. And you know, the, the environmental crisis, our relationship with, 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 with the planet and our need to fundamentally shift that relationship from behaving like a predatory toddler, taking what we need, sort of sucking on the breast of planet Earth and sucking her dry in a way that is going to drain her so she can no longer sustain us and we both perish. Um, you know, are we, are we gonna do that? Or can we find a way of developing another relationship which is more, more mutually supportive? Yeah. Um, and then if we are gonna do that, how, how do we do that? How do we transcend our regional differences, our political differences, our our economic imperatives, our sibling rivalries. How do we, how do we really work together in a way that works? Now, you know, and 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 if we don't do that, we're going to die. Um, would be one taken it. And so, what did COVID do for us? Well, you could say that COVID comes from Mother Earth. Um, it's an emanation of that archetype of feminine coming from Mother Earth. It gave us an experience of you know, constriction and contraction, it brought us an encounter with, with, with death. Um, you know, we all came just that tiny bit closer to death. Some of us, you know, really close to death and some of us died, but we had that encounter with death. And it brought us together in a way that has never really happened before, that we, we were all, we were all one um, against, you know, we were all uh, one trying to find a way to come together to, um, to meet this particular challenge. Um, you know, in some ways, maybe we've, you know, not, 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 not done that very well, but maybe there are also baby steps towards coming together as a community. And then, of course, just as we emerge from the pandemic, we are faced with the challenge of, you know, international law and, you know, our, our failure really to institute a process of international law 
And what do you do with naked aggression? And, you know, what do you do with um, rogue egos um, that, um, that, that seek to dominate in the way that we do? And maybe even how can we understand that? You know, what is, what, what would be the trauma, what would be the trauma view on that? And I suppose one view of that is that Russia has been a horribly traumatized country. And, you know, the, 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 the leader of Russia um, is behaving in a way that is particularly lacking in fragrance at the moment, but is a wounded individual. And, you know, I believe lost, lost two brothers before he was born in the context of the Nazi invasion of Russia in St. Petersburg. And, you know, how is that playing out? And, you know, in a way, we're still reliving wounds of history in a you know in a way that you know is is obviously really horrible to witness and but is there any way in which we can use that to you know to come together as a as a community to to make the world safer i think we're all seeing images on the news that fill us with horror but we're also seeing you know the bravery of people who say no we we love our land we we love our people um, and we're going to come together in a certain way to to show to show our love. Um, you know, you see the way in which other peoples in other countries are mobilising to, you know, to be with refugees with these you know the, these people who are in you know total states of distress and dislocation, who've lost everything and fear for everything. And the way in which people are trying to meet them with, you know. With, practical help and also and also compassion so you know we are on one hell of a trip right now um and it could go horribly wrong you know if you think about set and setting you know who who are the therapists here who are the containers who are who are the wise adults who are you know trying to hold the process and 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 and, and give it some shape now i think we mostly feel that there are not you know but the adults um, have yet to emerge in an impressive way and step into the room and hold this. Yeah, I think the context is really that we're in a rite of passage or an initiation from uh, adolescence to adulthood. And the question is, will we, will we make that step just like with the individual moving from the, you know, adaptive behavior of the child into a mature adult is a, 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 an individual process. It's also uh, a global process. I want to take some time to talk a little more about psychedelics and psychotherapy, your new book, The Healing Potential of Expanded States, and um, talk a little bit about what, uh, why you wrote this and who is it for and uh, some of the things that uh, people could get from reading your book. So we wrote it um, to showcase skillful ways of working with the deep psyche, not just psychedelics, mm -hmm. um, but with other practices like, like holotropic breath work. And the question is, how can we access these, these deep states in a way that is, is kind, is helpful, is skillful, is, is growthful? Um, and there's no single answer to those questions, which is why we had a multiplicity of authors you know, working in different ways, different uh, uh, um, approaches. It's a book that is aimed at uh, the lay person, anybody who's interested in working with psychedelics, who might have their own experience, who might be trying to make sense of deep psyche, but also for the many people who have got an interest in, in working in this way. So, you know, in the UK, we're certainly finding that there are many, you know, psychologists, psychotherapists, psychiatrists, uh, doctors working with, you know, conditions such as fibromyalgia, et cetera, who are so interested in finding ways of work, of, 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 of working with psychedelics. So are looking at kind of retraining or, 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 or using their skills in, in the context of working with psychedelics. Um, so it, it's a book that we hope will attract a, a, a broad church. There's no, there's no one vision, there's no particular dogma, um, except in terms of um, what Maria and I call depth relational process. So it's a way of working with deep psyche, mm -hmm. um, that the fundamental component of it is the relationship within which it unfolds. 
um, and it's a process. It takes it takes time. So we we are. If there's one thing we're against, it's the notion that you take a pill and you have an experience, um, and it does something to your your brain circuits and tweaks your default mode network, and you're sorted. Um, you know, we, we think that's a profoundly unhelpful attitude. I mean, there's talk in the drug companies about finding psychedelics, about the psychedelic effects. Um, so you can have, you know, an effect on the brain, but without the psychological experience. Now, you know, that might be a little bit helpful. You know, we wouldn't want, to, but, um, but, but it's, not, it's not a maturation experience. It's not a healing experience. It's not a growth experience. It doesn't take us more deeply into what it's like to be human. It's not going to make us likely more more compassionate. More, yeah. What if what if someone feels called to be a psychedelic guide? What's talk about the path? I know you're starting some trainings uh, there in England. Talk talk about the path. What's required and what what would produce um, a really well performing functioning uh, psychedelic guide. Well, I, I think there's a couple of different levels. Um, so one level would be someone who comes from a therapeutic or clinical background uh, who wants who wants to be a guide. Um, and then um, uh, uh, and then the next level would be someone who's an expert in the deep psyche and working with the deep psyche. So I, say, I think there's two levels of training. I think the basic requirement for whatever level of training is some, some form of clinical background. So there's some familiarity with working within a clinical or therapeutic framework. Uh, you know, having done a, 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 re, a, reputable, tra a reputable training, uh, having undergone some sort of supervised practice. Um, and in my, it could, you know, in, in, in our view, it could be any sort of practice. So in our training, as well as, you know, your psychotherapists, psychologists, psychiatrists, we've also taken on people who've done body work trainings um, um, and, 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 and other, other form of uh, energetic trainings, et cetera. Um, we think that to be a skilled practitioner of the deep psyche, you, you need to have had your own unfolding experiences. Um, so in our training, we're using a combination of methods such as family constellations and meditation practice, um, practices such as social dreaming, um, holotropic breathwork retreats, and legal work with, with psilocybin, uh, which we'll be doing in the Netherlands. Um, and that will all be within the context of ongoing integrative psychotherapy um, and the process of going through it together in a group uh, as, as a group process um, so as with any proper psychotherapy training some of it is theoretical but the most important part is experiential working with yourself and working with other people um, talk about the ethics and the you know uh the integrity of it and and also where do you see it going it seems like there's you know maps and these organizations are getting very large and a lot of money is getting invested in this and that doesn't always help in a in a developmental process so what are your thoughts about the evolution and the ethics so the reason why maria Papasbiru and I started the Institute of Psychotherapy is because we have our own particular vision about how we want to work and how we want to help the work develop. And I can only speak to that. I can't really speak for other organizations. Obviously, there are, there are num other players, you know, I think MAPS has got a feels a responsibility to train a lot of therapists and on un un and unfold. And, and help the work to unfold in a way that's going to help a great deal of people. I've got huge respect for that. Um, but if you have a big organization, then uh, there, there, are some, um, there are some difficulties that go with that. So M Maria and I are only going to work with 20 people at a time. Um, we think the, the, the personal journey through the work is of, of, of central importance. Uh, we think that the qualities of, of integrity openness, kindness um, are, are the fundamental requirement to that sort of work. So we very carefully select people that do not have problematic ego structures and who, who, who come from that place. Um, 
Um, in terms of ethics, we have an ongoing, we have an ethics focus group within our community, um, and we commit ourselves to an ongoing process of, of, of inquiry about that. Um, we, 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 we work within the legal framework. Um, what else can I say? Um, I was going to ask you, what should the lay person that's looking for the therapeutic value of it be looking for in a therapist, in, a, in an organization? You know, if, if somebody wants to, uh, oh, yeah, I'd like to try this. I've got a lot of trauma in my past. Uh, I've heard that there is value in that. But there's a lot of people that aren't, are not so well trained that are doing this. So how do we distinguish that if we're looking for a therapist or a person uh, to work with? Well, I, I, as, as you say, it's a mind, minefield. Um, and it's particularly difficult at the moment because psychedelic psychotherapy is, is not legal in the UK. You, know, you can't legally work with psychedelics in the UK outside of clinical trials. Um, and there's no, there's, no accredited, there's no accredited training, which makes the normal process of therapist seeking even more complicated. But uh, as always, you want to be clear about what you're looking for. You want to make sure that your therapist is properly trained um, and the personal chemistry needs to be right. Um, so I, th I think all, all of those things. Uh, I think people looking for, for, for underground work are, are, are vulnerable. You know, you can be lucky, you can get good advice, you can find somebody who holds the work in, 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 in impeccably. Um, you can also find somebody who's attracted to working with psychedelics and um, but might not have the skills or experience to work with some of the more problematic manifestations of, of, what, of, what, what, of what might emerge. Um, there are so many people who are desperately looking for healing and who will go to great lengths. There have been floods of, you know, of people, a lot of young people, traumatized young people going to South America in search of healing. Um, I mean, and for my generation, maybe your generation, we used to go to India in search of gurus and spiritual teachers. Uh, now, now people go to, 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 to ayahuasca. And we, we, we all know that ayahuasca work is unregulated. There are a lot of fraudulent practitioners who have got the medicine, but have got no idea, you know, are interested in taking your money, but you know, really do not have the skills in providing you know, preparation, the, the safe setting, or, or any sort of integration, and there have been multiple casualties. Um, yeah. yeah. My response to that is often, listen to your body. All the other things too, but listen to your body. <laughs> it's, I like that. I like I'm that. a somatic approach person, but yeah. yeah. So we're getting close to the end here. Um, any last things you want to share with people? We've got the stage here, and uh, what would you like to say that we didn't really talk about or address? Um, I, I guess, I guess, a word of caution. Um, you know, there, there's so much enthusiasm about work with psychedelics at the moment. Um, you know, the, the 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 media is curious and enthusiastic which is really nice and so so different to you know to how, how it was at the end of the first first generation um i i've been in this business for long enough to know that evangelical enthusiasm tends to be followed by some some setbacks and some 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 disappointments so i think we need to study ourselves for look for the long haul you know the the, the slow process of learning, the development of skills, you know, the, 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 long, the long haul of working with people. When I did my holotropic breathwork training, both myself and working with other people, you know, we, we generally found it took three, four, five years of repeated immersions into expanded states for the real, real work to be done. Mm. Um, now, it's not always going to be like that. Often people are going to get you know, sort of huge improvements after one, two, maybe maybe three, three sessions. And we're, we're seeing that in some of the, some of the clinical trials. Um, so I suppose a, a word about, about patience and caution and yeah. Taking the time. Taking the time to do it properly. Yeah, yeah right. 
it comes to mind when you said evangelical, my first word was, my first thought about evangelical was trauma induced. <laughs> because yeah, often right. it is a, a trauma response, right? The, the yeah. hyperactive, um, you know, Masonic kind of uh, tendencies that come with it. Yeah, yeah, and I think we're all so desperate to help, you know, so desperate to help ourselves, desperate to help those people that we work with. Yeah. Um, so yes. often, the, you know, the enthusiasm generally comes from, from a good place. Yeah. Tim Reed, it's been delightful to spend time with you. Thank you so much. Again, the book is Psychedelics and Psychotherapy, The Healing Potential of Expanded States. And uh, how can people get a hold of you if they want to do your training or connect with you? What's your website? Uh, the Institute of Psychedelic Therapy is where you will find Maria and myself. Okay. And dot com. Is that dot com? Uh, is it dot com dot org? Dot org. Okay, great. All right. Well, thanks so much for being on We Earth Radio. So nice to meet you, Michael, and thank, thanks for all the great work you're doing and your, 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 your generosity that puts yourself out there in this way. Thank oh, you so much. Thank you. Okay, bye now. We Earth Radio is an independently produced program supported by listeners like you. We are committed to bringing you leading edge thinkers in the areas of environmental restoration, social justice, conscious evolution, and spiritual fulfillment. If you would like to receive our complimentary newsletter, The Well of Light, make a contribution, or listen to any of our past shows, go to our website, welloflight.com. Thank you so much for your commitment to a world that works for all life.